recording. All right, we are recording. All right, so everybody's aware of the exam this week, right, over chapters 10, 11, and 12. Um, <clears throat> you should also be getting into chapter 14. I know you're probably focused on 10, 11, and 12, however, but again, just want to encourage you to not, you know, wait until the last minute to get into our last couple chapters. So, uh, any questions on the test, what's coming up? Um, um, maybe just like going through like the like the like main points of like each like chapter. I know that like we did that for the past couple of tests, and that always helped a lot. Like going through just, like the powerpoints and like saying like the main like things and each thing to focus on. Yeah, sure. So let me um, let me pull up Blackboard. And start with chapter 10. Is that um, visible to everybody? Yeah, okay, great. So this chapter on genetic engineering is one that um, I didn't cover as thoroughly as I typically would cover most of the chapters because it is a fairly technical chapter. So what we do at the beginning is just sort of define what we mean by biotechnology because that's a, a term that's been around now for oh, probably at least 20 or 30 years, which is basically the process of manipulating an organism in some way. It could be a genetic manipulation. It could be a biochemical or um, metabolic manipulation um, with the idea that we can use this to our advantage, to our benefit, whether it's the construction of new drugs or, or even drug treatment modalities, um, making um, plants more drought tolerant, more pesticide resistant, um, making them more nutritious, um, making, their, making them more economical for countries that uh, are, are poorer countries, if you will, right, to help address famine issues. I mean, there's just, the, the list goes on and on and on, right? There's a lot of- the PowerPoint. I don't know if it's up yet not, or not. Okay, I thought it was, that's why I was asking. Is it up there now? Yeah, we can see it now. Okay. So <clears throat> again, it's the manipulation of bacteria, plants, fungi, any, any cell you wanna talk about, prokaryotic or eukaryotic to our benefit. And along with that, we know our moral, religious, ethical questions that arise. At least they should arise in your mind as you think about this and study this. But I'm gonna leave that to the um, sociologists and the ethicists. Um, certainly not to say that there aren't concerns that people have of that, uh, because there are. Okay, so what we're going to talk about first <clears throat> is this notion of manipulating the DNA, the nucleic acids, could be RNA too for that matter. And so what one has to be able to do is to be able to 
to identify areas of the DNA, specific genes that code for proteins. You remember that from one of the earlier chapters when we talked about protein synthesis, right? That was transcription followed by translation. And what scientists do is they have to be able to snip out the desired segments of the DNA and then do something with those. And so they typically use these restriction endonuclease enzymes. I'm not gonna get into how they're used. I don't even understand how they're all manipulated. But these are enzymes, we know that because it ends in ASE, right? And so think of them as um, surgical scalpels of the DNA world that um, we use to cut the beginning and the ending piece or pieces of, of, a, of a piece of DNA. So it's important to be able to identify the desired gene. And once we have done that and we can snip it out and we can perhaps insert it into say a bacterium, for example, or even a yeast cell, which you know is a eukaryotic cell, right? So, fungus, type of fungus, we can have that cell transcribe and translate that gene and make the desired end product protein. Maybe it's a hormone. Maybe it's a drug. It could be any number of different things. So it has to be somehow put into a cell, like a bacterial cell or a yeast cell, let's say. It's often often what is used. Um, and in order to do that, we can manipulate plasmids and viruses to help introduce that DNA into that cloning host cell, the bacterium of the yeast cell. So, so try to get the big picture here as opposed to a lot of the minutia, because the minutia can get very complicated. But does everybody have a, have a sense of what I'm kind of getting at? Yes. Okay. So this next set of slides is sort of a pictorial representation of what we were just talking about. Snipping out the desired gene using restriction endonuclease enzymes, placing that in this, in this case, inserting it into a plasmid, which you know is extra chromosomal DNA that bacteria have, right? and then placing that into a bacterial cell or some sort of a cloned host cell, they call it. And as I said a moment ago, the cell responds by utilizing the direction booklet it was given, i.e. the blue piece of DNA and transcribing that into messenger RNA and translating that into the desired end protein could be these sorts of things, as I mentioned a moment ago, hormones, different drugs, vaccines can be made this way too. Or maybe insert that gene via a plasmid or even a, 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 a bacteriophage um, into a bacterium, or in this case, a plant cell and we have what's called a transgenic plant, a plant that whose genetics has been altered. Why would we wanna do that? Well, I mentioned earlier, drought tolerant plants, pesticide resistant plants, plants that can grow in poorer soil conditions. The, the list goes on and on and on, somehow making that plant better, a better plant, if you will, producing more berries, producing more wheat, producing more barley, whatever, producing more corn, you know. So that's obviously getting into manipulation of plants here. And then, of course, this whole notion also of using this technology to um, help address some um, health issue that humans might have. 
maybe introducing a gene that's lacking in an individual. Let's say that person suffers from a genetic disorder. If we could somehow insert the gene that they're lacking or missing, then they can synthesize that enzyme or make that particular compound or whatever that they need for a healthy lifestyle. And so that's kind of what the, that's the broad picture. And that's kind of what the chapter sort of starts to talk about. So that's in essence what, what the next few slides talk specifically about. What are some desirable features of these cells, these cells that we clone in the laboratory? Again, usually they're bacteria or yeast cells. But we can grow them fast, we can grow them cheaply. They're not pathogenic. We know their genome. We've mapped out the genes in the, in the small genome of a bacterial cell or a yeast cell. E. coli being probably the most famous bacterium used in many biotechnological experiments. It's been used for 50 years plus. And then again, here are some end products as a result of combining new genes into existing cells to produce enzymes, hormones, vaccines, even spider silk of all things to help make better parachutes and stronger bulletproof vests. It's crazy all the different things that, that we can make much more efficiently, much cheaper by manipulating genes. Uh, and then I go through some examples of um, a product called Frostban that was first released many, many decades ago. Um, this was never marketed, but it was the idea was to use this genetically modified organism to reduce frost formation on plants so you could lengthen the growing season of a, of a particular you know, vegetable, let's say, or a crop. Um, so I just throw this in here as the first historically documented manipulation at, that reached the commercial level, this product called Frostband, which was, again, never, never made it to market, but it was on its way to market to be utilized. And the ironic thing is that they, they used the same bacterium, which was, I think, Pseudomonas. Yeah, Syringe is the name of it, kind of a funny name. Um, well, they ended up using it and to help make snow. I mean, Holiday Valley, Hollymont, and Ellicottville, and many other snow-making ski resorts, uh, if they don't get adequate natural snow, they've got to make their own snow, right? Some years it's, it's, it's not very snowy, and the amount of snow you have as a base determines how much money you're going to make as a ski lodge or, or whatever, right? So by utilizing this genetically modified bacterium, it turns out you can make snow at higher temperatures. So think about this. Snow freezes at one, uh, water freezes at what temperature? Hello? Water freezes at what temperature? 32. 32 Fahrenheit, and what is it in Celsius? Zero degrees Celsius. Right, zero. What if I could make snow at 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Would that be helpful to me as a ski resort manager? Obviously it would. I'm not having to wait for the weather to get to zero degrees. I can start making snow at 40. Well, that's what they do. They can make snow at higher temperatures than the freezing point of water by manipulating the snow guns and what they put into it, which is mostly water, but also this this bacterially manipulated bacterium. Isn't that interesting? So they don't use the bacterium per se, but they use the protein that it makes to, to assist in that crystal formation at higher temperatures, which is sort of interesting. It's called Snowmax. Um, and then there's some other discussion here about the manipulation of bacteria or of uh, plants to make them more uh, 
bioremedially friendly, if you will, using plants to clean up toxic um, oil spills. Or um, in the case of Chernobyl, Ukraine, this was the famous um, uh, meltdown of the, of the nuclear reactor back in the mid 80s. Maybe you read about that, heard about that. Um, well, if we could genetically modify a plant so that it could more efficiently absorb the radioactive isotopes, then we could remove that more efficiently from the local water, for example. Now, granted, the, the plants become radioactive. It's not like you're getting rid of the isotope. You're just taking it from the environment and you're putting it into a, a vehicle, if you will, that you can then presumably dispose of in some way. You're, so you're just kind of taking one problem and, and having to deal with another problem, but at least you're you're taking it out of the environment. You know what I mean? You're, you're, it's called photo or uh, bioremediation. And back in the late 80s, this, this uh, big oil spill occurred in the Prince William Sound of Alaska, and it coated the shoreline for hundreds and hundreds of miles. A lot of mammals like uh, seals died, and, and many birds were coated by the oil, and they died. It was just a, it was a, it was a uh, catastrophe ecologically at the time. Um, but Exxon made an attempt to clean it up. And one method that they did use was they sprayed bacteria on the shoreline in big nozzles, you know, like, like fire hoses almost. And, um, and in that spray were, were bacteria that were able to metabolize the petroleum that was lining the rocks. So it was, again, another example of bioremediation. Now that was a naturally, I think, a natural, that was a naturally produced um, bacterium. I think that metabolized the petroleum. But you can take that particular desirable behavior, if you will, or uh, chemical that breaks on the petroleum and insert it into other gene, into other bacteria rather, and and use those for bioremediation. So again, utilizing genetically altered organisms to our advantage to clean up an oil spill. Um, I didn't talk a lot about these oncolytic adenoviruses. They're kind of cool. Um, basically trying to take viruses and inserting desirable um, traits into that virus, letting the virus infect the cancer cell, and in so doing, killing the cancer. It's, it's been in the research um, field for quite a few decades. It's not marketed yet, I don't believe, but it would not surprise me if soon down the road, we're using bioengineered viruses as part of cancer treatment. And you all know that viruses target particular cells, right? Based upon the receptor sites on the whole cell. Remember all this from chapter 11 or whatever it was? Not 11, whatever the virus chapter was. Well, if you could somehow identify specific unique protein markers on a cancer cell and devise a docking system on a virus that would only fit onto that specific protein that the cancer cell is, is uh, exhibiting, that would allow that virus in. And if that virus somehow had anti-cancer abilities in terms of being able to produce a chemical, let's say that just killed that cell, sort of like a, a missile that specifically targeted that cancer cell and not healthy surrounding cells, that has major ramifications, right? Think about it. So anyway, there's some hyperlinks that talk about oncolytic adenoviruses, but a lot, a lot of work left to do on that. Um, this just talks about, uh, again, transgenic plants introducing, again, a desired uh, gene into a, into a plant, and that eventually produces seeds. Now, this is a pea plant, it looks like. So if you could somehow introduce, let's say, a um, pesticide-resistant characteristic into a plant, so instead of having to spray the, the farm field with pesticide, you could give the plant its own built-in protection from insects, 
that are trying to eat the leaves and the twigs and the branches of the parent plant. And then the plant would, presum would presumably pass on that gene in its offspring. Now, when we talk about offspring and plants, we're talking about seeds, right? If you're a gardener, you're buying seeds now and you're planting them in, this, in your garden and you're hoping to get tomatoes or peppers or beans or whatever. So manipulate a plant. Those desired genes are transmitted into the seeds. Plant the seeds. The resulting plants now have the pesticide resistant characteristic. That's what that talks about. Here are some other examples of genetically modified plants and what benefit we've been able to breed into them as a result of artificial selection and introduction of genes. So I circled bananas just because I thought it was kind of interesting. So rather than going and getting a flu shot in the fall, maybe you just eat a banana. So you mean they're working on that. People are scared to death to get a shot. <laughs> well, it's not too scary to eat a banana. You can get the same vaccine theoretically for hepatitis B. So working on that. Um, again, improved nutrition, we talked about that. Herbicide resistance, if we can incorporate that into the plant without having to spray the herbicide, which is you know, spraying not just the soybean, but also the, the milkweed that's killing the monarch butterfly and it's getting into the groundwater. And there's a lot of reasons why if we can localize that that desired trait in the plant, and we're not inf influencing other plants peripherally, you know, accidentally, if you will. Wheat has long been manipulated to try to improve its nutrition or its resistance to drought or blight. These are, uh, you know, fungal diseases that can wipe out vast acreages of wheat and barley and corn, the big, the big uh, cereal grain crops. Um, so transgenic plants, genetically modified plants have been around for quite a long time. And in fact, today, when you look at the amount of corn that a farmer plants in Iowa or Nebraska or South Dakota or New York state, the vast majority of plants, corn plants, soybean, cotton, look at the genetically engineered crops here, it goes to 2015. You know, we're talking 80, 80 plus percent, 80 to 94 percent of cash crops are genetically engineered. Now, when you look at these two ears of corn, what do you notice? They, they look the same, don't they? Yet the genetically modified plant that gave rise to this nice, healthy ear of corn takes less pesticide, produces enough calories to feed lots of people, is a higher yield crop, and has allowed farmers to make more money over the long run. Now, again, this is a little bit, uh, what's the word? This, this data probably came from a company like Monsanto that makes its money by selling genetically engineered seeds, right? So everybody can put, can put a positive spin on anything. And I'm not saying this is not true. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying the data is, is wrong. They're just making promises or whatever, trying to impress people. No, this is, I'm not, I don't doubt the data, um, but it, it all comes somewhat at a cost, i.e., uh, you know, sh should we be doing that? Well, you know, is it natural? No, it's not natural. It's artificial. We're manipulating the system with you, if you will. But there's some there's some positives to it too. Um, this is getting at transgenic animals, how we manipulate the genes of animals. Um, there's technologies now that allow us to actually insert the genetic information directly into the fertilized egg. It's crazy, but they have micro pipettes. They're so small, you need a microscope to see them. And, and they're able to 
extract the gene and actually insert it into the egg. It's, it's, it's amazing. Now it's the, it's a fertilized egg. So the sperm's fertilized the egg. You have basically a zygote, you know, they call it here a pronucleus, but now if, if you can insert the gene into the zygote, what's going to, what's going to happen to all the other cells that are derived once that zygote begins to divide? You guys have had a ENP2, you know, basic reproduction development, right? The zygote forms into two cells. Those two cells form into four cells. Those four cells form into eight cells, right? It's called mitosis. All of those cells that form from that zygote will carry that desired gene that was inserted at the very beginning of the process. So we create all sorts of interesting things. Now, this is, again, kind of a crazy example, but we're talking about these two mice that have, as embryos, been, in, been um, injected with a particular gene that when you shine a black light on the mice like we're doing here, its eyes have this fluorescent glow to them. Looks like the ears kind of do too, don't they? And guess what else? The tails appear to be even colored for some reason. So, you know, it's just sort of a silly example, but it, it's kind of amazing, isn't it? Um, when you go to buy a goldfish or buy fish at the, at the store, you can buy particular breeds of fish that have been genetically modified to be different colors through, through the same sort of technology. Um, of more important applicable use, I guess, is the idea that now we can take particular human genetic diseases, and they mention here like cystic fibrosis, Alzheimer's disease, sickle cell anemia, and um, we're in the process of using some, some they call them mouse models, we're manipulating the genetics of mice to see if we can somehow create um, desired end products that could be useful in, in the treatment of some of these diseases. This notion of farming, the pH, like pharmaceutical farming, is talking about that very idea of manipulating the genetics of, a, of an animal like a sheep or a goat and having them produce milk or semen, as weird as that sounds, within which is the desired product protein that can be recovered and purified. So using animals as pharmaceutical factories is really what it, we're talking about here. It's a pretty crazy thought, isn't it? But it's, it's being done. So this is talking more about um, some of the different pharmaceuticals that have been derived from cows and sheep and pigs and goats. Um, and also some additional research that's being done now to, to grow, say, uh, Atlantic salmon um, in farms. Prior to this time, you had to go out into the wild and catch salmon. You go to the store and buy Alaska fresh caught salmon, you're spending 20 bucks a pound plus. Well, farm raised salmon, probably half the price. And they grow twice as fast as regular salmon and you can Make sure they don't get eaten by killer whales and other predators. You, you manipulate their environment. You, you feed them food. They grow twice as fast. You get them to market quicker. You make more money. Any idea how this salmon might taste compared to a wild caught salmon? Presumably what? Tastes better, worse, the same? What do you think? The same. Should taste the same, right. Just like the corn cob from the genetically modified corn, whether it's you know sweet corn or whatever, should taste the same as if you didn't modify the seed. In other words, the, the quality of the product should be as good or better, theoretically, right? And then this is getting into um, the utilization of this in terms of gene therapy sort of toward the end of the chapter. 
This started about 30 or 40 years ago. So inserting a, a normal functioning gene into a, into a patient that's lacking that gene. So a lot of the inherited disorders, for example, would, would potentially be likely candidates for this sort of therapy. And, and also then utilizing, in this case, a virus. You all recognize this hopefully as an envelope virus to which the desired gene has been introduced and cloned into this retrovirus. You take bone marrow from a patient, you infect the bone marrow cells, which are the hemocytoblasts, um, with the, with the uh, retrovirus. And of course, what's a virus going to do? All viruses want to get into, this, into the cell and, and release their DNA, right? Well, retroviruses are, are releasing what into the cell? What kind of nucleic acid do retroviruses introduce? You better know the answer to this. Retroviruses carry what kind of nucleic acid? You get two choices, DNA or DNA. RNA. DNA. Pardon? Which one? DNA. Wrong. They're RNA. They introduce RNA. Retroviruses, remember, use reverse transcriptase enzyme to take the messenger RNA and make DNA from it. It's the reverse of transcription. That's why it's called reverse transcriptase. Um, we're getting some chat here. Let me see what this is indicating. Um, Uh, I'm not finding chat here very well. I'm sharing the screen with my PowerPoint. Let's see. I was just answering the questions that you were oh, asking. Okay. 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 Great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I'm having a hard time flipping back and forth. All right. So this case using, again, a virus that would ordinarily be something we don't want to get, right? We don't want to get infected with the virus. Well, we do in this case because we can take that desired gene that the patient's lacking, for example, introduce it into the virus, let the virus infect the cell, and then have the cell insert that desired gene into the bone marrow stem cell. And then all of the resulting progeny cells that come from the bone marrow, go back and look at ANP1. You, we've talked about this in the blood chapter, just talked about it today, in fact. Um, all the progeny white cells that form from those myeloid and lymphoid stem cells are all gonna carry the desired preferred gene. And that patient, hopefully, um, is going to, as it says here, express the normal gene. They didn't have it before because of maybe, again, inheriting, didn't, didn't inherit it from one of their parents, whatever, they're deficient in that gene. Well, now they have it. So again, some interesting applications here. And uh, I think that was the end of chapter 10. So there's there's big chunks of it here that, again, I did not talk about. So obviously, you don't have to worry about those sections. Let me stop sharing for a second and see if there are que questions. Hannah, was that helpful? Yeah. So that was chapter 10. Um, now I can read the chats. All right, so let's pull up um, 11. Physical and chemical agents for microbial control. All right, do you see that PowerPoint? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So this chapter is a fairly long chapter. Well, I don't know, maybe it's not as long as I thought. 22 pages, I don't know, that's pretty big. So it's covering lots of territory how we control microbes, bacteria, 
protozoans maybe, viruses. And so it's broken up into obviously these three major methodologies. And we just kind of go through each of those talking a little bit about what makes the physical agents different from the mechanical agents, which makes it different from the chemical agents. I like this flow chart because it gives you sort of an immediate single view, if you will, of, of the three you know, methodologies and some of the subsets below that. So you can always come back to this if you're wondering, well, where does boiling water pasteurization fit in? Is that chemical? Well, no, it's physical. Um, so I think it's, again, just kind of a nice figure to, to look at. So this talks about the different resistance characteristics of different microbes, the fact that prions, which remember are infectious proteins, and endospores are one of the more difficult forms of the microorganism to, to get rid of, to, to control. Now, again, this, this, is, a, this is a protein. This isn't, isn't even a cell. When you think of prions, what should you think about? What sort of disorders, diseases, anybody? Mad cow disease. Right. Bovine encephalopathy, scrapie disease in sheep, right? And in humans? Do you remember? It's also a, a, an encephalopathy. What does that mean? Encephalopathy. Uh, well, think of the think of the cows. What did I show you a picture of? When we talked about this, or the video you watched that short little three minute video that the Mayo Clinic did. Is it like deterioration of like the brain? Yeah, right. The brain size diminishes. There are big gaps. When you look at the tissue sample of uh, brain tissue, right, the cerebrum, let's say a tissue of the left hemisphere of the cerebrum, you find big holes in it. That's what encephalopathy, spongiform encephalopathy means, holes in brain tissue. So um, kurzfeld jakob disease, it's called, is what humans get. It's, it's the, the mad cow version of what happens in humans. Yeah. So it's a pretty interesting but scary disease. Um, and then we, we talk about a few more moderate resistant forms of, in this case, a couple of different bacteria. These are the, the genera and some that are much easier to kill. And you'll note that most bacterial vegetative cells fall under this heading. The difference between a vegetative cell and an endospore is what? Most of the bacteria that you run across in your everyday life are what? What form? Endospores are vegetative. Vegetative. Right, they're vegetative forms. Well, that's kind of a good thing in the sense that they're the easiest to kill compared to, say, endospores, which you know, in order to, to, to kill these resistant forms of the bacteria, you've got to really autoclave or, or, or use some very significant technique to, to make sure you can guarantee sterility, right? The reason we autoclave our media in the bio lab is to make sure that we're knocking out the endospores, because they can survive under conditions that vegetative cells would never have any chance at. You know? um, I think it's also worth noting, this is interesting, that naked viruses are more resistant than enveloped, and you see why. Naked viruses are naked because they lack an outer capsule, right? You just have basically the nucleocapsid, nothing beyond that. Well, in an, in an envelope virus, like we saw a moment ago with regard to the retrovirus, remember used in gene therapy or in, in um, human therapy, gene therapy, it had an outer envelope. Well, that outer envelope is made up of protein and lipid. And because it's made up of protein and lipid, it's more susceptible to different 
antimicrobial te techniques that would, would rupture those lipids or denature those proteins. This gets at the difference between endospore and vegetative forms and how, again, endospores are a heck of a lot more resistant. You'd have to bombard them with four times the x-ray radiation to ensure their, their demise than you would vegetative cells. Four times, that's pretty astounding. Um, or certain types of, of sporicidal liquids require 18 times the exposure time. So 10 minutes to kill a vegetative form of a bacterium bacillus, megatarium, let's say. Three hours to guarantee the, the destruction of the bacillus megatarium spores. So yeah, pretty obvious, <laughs> I think, how much more resistant endospores are than vegetative cells. And then we you know, begin to define some terms like what does it mean to be sterilized or what does sterilization really mean from a microbiological point of view? Well, again, we say the destruction of the vegetative cells and the endospores and the destruction of, of viruses, which of course aren't really cells, but they do have an outer protein coat, right? Making them a little, most of most viruses anyway have a protein coat, not all. Um, making them somewhat susceptible, just as we said before, um, at least the enveloped ones. But some naked viruses and um, other forms of viruses can be can be pretty resilient. But there are ways to sterilize equipment or whatever and rid it, if you will, of any possible viral load. So when you go to the doctors uh, or you go to the dentist to get your teeth cleaned or you go to the uh, hospital to get an operation, whatever, let's hope that they are using sterilized scalpels and scissors and so forth. And they, and they are. Um, what does it mean to, to undergo disinfection? What is a disinfectant? Again, these are all terms that I think is pretty self-explanatory. Um, I think this word here is kind of interesting. We don't use it a whole lot. Sanitation. When you think of sanitation, think of a restaurant having to sanitize its silverware, forks, knives, and spoons. Does, does that have to be sterilized? No, no. You just need to make sure you are removing the vast majority of microbes from that surface. But you cannot guarantee that that spoon you're using when you go to uh, Perkins for supper to get the soup uh, is sterile. It's not. You can't guarantee that. But is that important? Is that something that has to happen? Do you have to have sterile, you know, silverware? No, you really don't. Keep in mind the food you're eating is that sterile? <laughs> no. So you can't get away from bacteria. I mean. They're everywhere you are. And some would argue that we live in, in a, we live a lifestyle that is too, um, what, fixated on having a clean, sterile workspace or, I mean, it, 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 we, we know we can't have that, but this whole notion of, I think I mentioned in one of the videos where one, one study that was done suggests that maybe showering every day isn't really to our benefit in, in the long-term microbial world, that it might be better to not be so clean. I know it sounds kind of strange to say that, but, but from a, um, uh, a natural microbiome point of view, maybe showering too, too much is, is, is in the long run not doing ourselves any favors. Um, we define microbial death here, right? If the cells cannot reproduce, they cannot undergo binary fission, then and only then can we say we've killed the cells, that we have rendered them 
unable to reproduce. Because under the microscope, they might look dead, but they might not be dead. So if you provide them with proper growing conditions and nutrients, um, you know, and they reproduce, obviously they're not dead. So we talk about some factors that can influence the death rate, uh, the age of the cell, the length of time that's being exposed to the given antimicrobial agent, whether it's a chemical or UV or whatever the case may be. I think it's worth noting that actively dividing cells are more susceptible than older cells. Uh, in the same way that cancer cells tend to be more susceptible to chemoradiation than non-cancer cells. The reason for that is because the cells are dividing. And so um, these different techniques that we use, whether it's in chemotherapy or whether it's in you know, antimicrobial therapies, if you can sometimes manipulate the ability of the cell to divide or screw up its ability to replicate, you're, you're, you're basically preventing it from growing and the cells will, will, not, will not make it. So there's a whole host, number of microbes. Um, are there a, a mixture of different cells in that population? Is it just all Staph aureus or is there uh, you know, a mix of, of different kinds of bacteria and viruses and other materials there? When you think of a soil sample, for example, oh, well, there's many different species of bacteria. There's, there's probably fungi in that spoon of, spoonful of dirt. Um, so when you think about controlling microbes, um, you have to be mindful of, you know, what are you dealing with? Is it just one species? Is it a multitude of species? Is there, are there other cell types there? Are, is there organic debris present as well in that, in that environment? Um, then we talk about some other factors influencing, again, microbial death rates. I think I'm going to read that over. What does it mean to have a clean room? Um, there is a short little video that I hope you watched on, on that. Oops. This, these are photographs taken from, um, I'm not sure, could be NASA or SpaceX. Oftentimes you see, you know, uh, technicians in these, these gowns. And the video talks about, you know, making sure you you pass through different stages of cleanliness, if you will, before you go into the actual factory where they're constructing this telescope. Or I'm not exactly sure what these things are that the technicians are working on, but you you might have heard of the Hubble telescope that's orbiting the Earth. It's got a huge, huge uh, lens on it. Well, uh, when they first sent that up and they, and they put it together in a, in a huge clean room. Um, there was apparently some fungi that they didn't, well, it somehow got in and it started growing on the, on the glass of the Hubble and it obscured the view of the photographs that they were taking of these, you know, these galaxies far, far away. Um, all because of a single spore or a single cell that somehow got in and, and uh, it, it took this multi-billion dollar project and I'm not sure if they went up and actually cleaned it or how they fixed it, but um, it just goes to show that you, you can't take any chances. Any, anything like a bacterial cell or a fungal cell that gets into some of these pieces of equipment can influence you know, how they work. Um, and in terms of deciding what sort of antimicrobial agent we want to use, well, lots of questions to ask. How do we plan to sterilize? What, what, can we, what technique can we use? Are we dealing with the plastic material we're trying to sterilize? Is it metal? Is it glass? Is it a liquid? What method is suitable? Is it expensive? Is it something we can afford to do? And then we get into specific cellular targets. 
Well, a lot of this makes sense if you just think about your typical bacterial cell. You know, they're going to have a cell wall, most bacterial cells do, right? They're going to have a cell membrane. They're going to have nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. Well, we can use different sorts of chemicals or different kinds of physical agents to target those common cellular structures. That's kind of what they're getting at here. In lab last week, we did a, a, a lab that looked at the uh, effect of UV on microbial growth. And you might remember reading about how UV induces primidine dimer formation or thymine dimers in the DNA. So the DNA cannot replicate. If the DNA cannot replicate, the cell cannot divide. If the cell cannot divide, the cell dies. So that's what they're talking about here. Proteins, of course, are able to be denatured, meaning you can take the shape of that protein that dictates its function. And if you denature it, you alter the, the, format, the uh, conformation to such an extent that it no longer works the way it's supposed to. <coughs> and I think this is a little video, yeah, that talks about denaturation. Stephanie, question? No, sorry, I accidentally bumped the oh. I'm mute. No problem. This familiar gelatin dessert actually. Okay. Oh, and then we talk more about proteins and their importance of their shape, and you can read over that. So then we again uh, basically begin to survey these different three techniques. I'm not going to spend time on any of these unless you have questions. I think they're pretty self-explanatory. Define thermal death time, thermal death point. Here's our autoclave that we use. You've seen this in the lab. Those of you that have taken, are taking or have taken a micro lab, hopefully you know what an autoclave looks like. At least I showed my classes these, this device in our lab or prep room. This tindalization, uh, I'm not sure how widely used it is. Um, Boiling does not guarantee sterility. It certainly reduces the microbial load, no question about that, but it cannot um, necessarily remove endospores. Pasteurization, we perhaps associate this with milk, but milk is just one product that is pasteurized, as it mentions here, beer, fruit juices, different vaccines actually can also be, uh, can be uh, pasteurized. So in this case, what we're doing is we're trying to lower the microbial load to within acceptable levels. So when the milk comes from the bulk tank of the farmer and gets put into the big truck and the truck then goes to the dairy, um, it has a sizable microbial load in it. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever drinking raw milk before. Um, I used to spend some time in the summer as, as a kid growing up on the farm a couple of weeks. And um, my friends had, had dairy and hogs both. This is back, back in Iowa. And uh, whenever they needed milk, they went down to the ball tank and, and that, that was the milk that, that they drank. Why, why should they buy milk when, they, when they're exporting thousands of gallons of it you know, a, a week? But anyway, it's not like you can't drink raw milk. It, it, you know, I think your GI tract kind of has to get used to that, you know, that rich fat content, but also the microbial load is probably a little bit different. It's a lot different actually than what you'd buy at the store. But anyway, you, you can still drink raw milk, most people, um, but most of the time it gets taken, it gets pasteurized, it, it's heated to a certain temperature for a certain time frame that kills a lot of those cells. Not all of them, but a lot of them. And then, you know, it's bottled, brought to your store, and there's a date stamped on the bottle of milk. Um, today's the 27th, so if you bought a gallon of milk now, it probably would say good until, you know, May 10th or something like that. 
which means on May 10th, you should throw it out, right? That's what some people do. They get to the expiration date, half a gallon left. It's got to be bad. Dump it down the sink. It's still, it's still good. Should still be good. Once we get past the tenth, what can we probably assume? That it becomes less safe to drink, right? Because when when they date, date those bottles, they know what's going to happen to the microbial concentration as time goes on, OK? So when the bottle milk gets to Tops or Reeds or Wegmans, wherever you want to shop, there's a certain bacterial concentration or load, let's say X number of bacteria per 100 mils of milk or per mil of milk. They know that if they keep that milk at a refrigerated temperature of, I don't know, 40 degrees Fahrenheit, whatever your fridge is, that after about 10 days, the number of bacteria are going to go up. And once we get past that expiration date, it's going to be a higher number. In other words, the milk is going to probably go bad at some point in time after that date. But before that date, the microbial load or number is within acceptable limits. And, and you can't taste that. I mean, it tastes as good the day you bought it as a week later, but if you open it up three weeks from then, you know, you're, you're going to know and open the cap that it's going bad, right? We've all heard that, smelled that, tasted that maybe, smelled it before we probably drank it, right? So pasteurization is just taking a, a product and it's making it more marketable or usable over a longer time frame by knocking the microbial load or number down, knowing that over time it's going to start to go up. Um, dry heat incineration. Freezing. Does freezing kill bacteria? Well, it kills some of them, but it's not sterilization. There's no guarantee of sterility, even in the deepest, coldest part of your freezer at home. Yeah, there's bacteria that can, can live. Well, psychrophilic, cold loving bacteria, right? Yeah. Doesn't it just slow the growth down of the bacteria, like the cold? Sure. Um, even though the cells are, are viable, th theoretically, they're growing at such a slow, slow rate that it's very possible, you know, your food's going to be freezer burn, burned, and you're going to toss it well before it got spoiled. I mean, I, I guess I've never heard of anybody having something in the freezer for so long that it's spoiled. Have you? I haven't. I, I've seen like freezer burned food. You, you, you throw away because it's been in the bottom of the freezer for, you know, five years and you just found it the other day when you were taking an inventory. But, but yeah, the point being, you, you don't typically talk about sterile, sterile conditions um, under under cold regimes, you just you don't get that. It can preserve food, no question, but um, drying the the food out, desiccating it. Um, again, it's not really um, a sterilization technique. It it like freezing or pasteurization can lower the microbial numbers down to a point where it can stay viable, if you will, for a long period of time. But as it mentions here, Bacillus and Clostridium, some of those endospores can live for a long time if they're in very dry conditions. Because remember, the formation of endospores, an important part of that is to remove as much water. That's what that dipicolinic acid does. It removes the water from the endospore because that could prove um, harmful, if you will to the cell. You want to get rid of as much water as you can. Um, uh, 
Uh, radiation, again, uh, they talk about ionizing and what else? Ionizing and non-ionizing forms of radiation and what what they do. Um, I don't know how extensive the um, fruits and vegetables you buy at the store, uh, how, how much they've been irradiated to, again, keep them in a more viable condition longer. So obviously, raspberries are notorious for going bad quickly. And so you see the two photographs, one that has been irradiated and one that hasn't. And there's a stark difference, right? So does, does this mean that this fruit is radioactive? When people see any sort of sign that says this, these raspberries have been radiated to preserve their shelf life, what are 90% of people going to do? Probably. Are you going to buy it? Well, hopefully you'd buy it because you'd know it's safe. But a lot of people see the word radiation and they assume it's radioactive. So it can't be good to buy. Well, no, this is, these are not radioactive raspberries. They are raspberries that have been irradiated to lower the microbial number. And then we talk about non-ionizing, UV, treatment of municipal water supplies, hospital rooms, uh, and that kind of thing. It's very effective in killing lots of different cells. It doesn't sterilize, but it certainly disinfects very nicely. We get into mechanical control techniques. Don't talk a whole lot about, about this, but filtration is, is the primary heading here. And if you think about certain hospital rooms, you know, from for say a burn victim, for example, they have to have number one, super clean air in that room that's filtered of any possible pathogen. Today, of course, we're talking about, about um, dentist offices, uh, office buildings, airplanes, schools that have had these HEPA filters added, or at least the system has been has been improved with more filter more filters to catch coronavirus. So if you can if you can trap the pathogen or the potential pathogen either through you know a physical <clears throat> filter like we have here, this is a classic setup that, that we perform in chemistry all the time. So you you pour the, the liquid <clears throat> in this container. And we used to do this in micro lab actually many years ago. We take a bacterial broth, okay We'd pour it into a, a container, and then it would have a special filter on the one end, and we would we would slap that onto a little rubber gasket, uh, and then down below would be a, a flask flask that had a, a little uh, glass kind of mouth that came off the edge, and you'd put a another tube here on that little mouth, and you'd apply a, a vacuum, so it sucked the air out, you know, in this direction as the air applies. And that would pull down, it would suction the liquid through the filter. And the bacteria would get caught, of course, up here. And the liquid down below that's been filtered would be what is left in the bottom of the flask, presumably sterile, right? Because we've trapped the bacteria. So this is a technique you can use for sterilization, provided you understand you know, what it is you're trying to filter. If I'm trying to filter viruses, I'm not going to use the same filter that I would use for bacteria because viruses are a hell of a lot smaller than bacteria, right? Most of them. But it's effective. It works. And then the, the chapter wraps up talking about um, chemicals, different types of gases and liquids. Termicidal levels of germicides, high, middle, low, depending, depending upon what it is we're trying to treat. If you're trying to 
you know, clean a uh, blood pressure cuff that you're, you're using every day on a patient, you don't need to use the same germicidal chemicals here as you would say on a catheter you're going to be putting into a patient, right? This is much more critical that this be devoid of bacteria than say the electron, uh, the electrode strap for the EKG or, or whatever it might be. Um, the thermometer that you give your son or daughter to take their temperature if you suspect they have a fever. Well, most people probably don't do much other than run soap and water over that you know, thermometer once they're done using it, and, and that's typically fine. But it just depends upon what it is you're trying to, to clean. Um, again, knowing what kind of microbe it is you're, you're trying to, you know, get rid of. Um, what is the material you're trying to treat? Is it plastic? Is it glass? Is it, um, you know, a, a rubberized synthetic material of some sort or uh, just depends on what it is you're trying to treat. And what kind of chemical are you using? What are the actions of that chemical? Are, uh, you know, how will it interact with plastic or rubber or glass? And so uh, I think this question came up last week, you know, what sort of chemicals should we know? And I've kind of highlighted those with the arrows. And I know, again, it's most all of them here. Um, but we go through and we talk about many of these. And some of you guys are probably bringing some of these today to lab, at least the morning group did, because we're, we're sampling different kinds of disinfectants and antiseptics to see how effective they are <clears throat> in controlling microbial growth. So it's just kind of a topical thing that we're getting into today. Um, these all have their advantages. in terms of how effective they are in killing pathogens. So again, I'm not going to go through all of these. So that's chapter um, 11. In the short time we have left, 12 is on drugs, chemotherapy. Um, Let me see if I can share that screen. Everybody see that? I'm the only one showing their camera. Are you guys here with me or not? Yes, you could, I could see it when you pulled it up. OK, just want to make sure you're not just like walking away and going shopping here or something. Okay, um, so let's see, chapter 12. So again, um, I can't go this, through this whole thing in seven minutes, but you should be familiar with the basic um, fact that most of our naturally produced um, antibiotics are derived from a handful of um, sources, some of which are bacteria, like, like this cluster of bacteria here, the bacillus genera and streptomyces here are, are quite important. Um, cephalosporium is a mold, as is penicillium. You've heard of this because it produces penicillin. It actually, it's a group of penicillins and not just one. We talk about penicillins, we talk about cephalosporins, <clears throat> we talk about bacitracin cream, polymyxin, this antifungal uh, ointment that you find in, in topical ointments. And then in the whole slug of antibiotics here, some of which we'll talk about in lab uh, today, are derived from bacteria. So these are naturally produced antimicrobial drugs that these organisms make in an attempt to kill their neighbor. That's what they're doing, right? We're just taking these to our advantage. We're manipulating them and synthetically modifying their chemical formula, if you will, making new semi-synthetic drugs. But there are some antibiotics out there that are natural 
and derived from, again, naturally existing microorganisms. So we talk about that. We get into some technology or some terminology here uh, that I think you should take a look at some of these terms, be familiar with what it means to be a broad spectrum or a narrow spectrum antibiotic. If you all kind of know what that gets at, right? What does it mean by semi-synthetic versus synthetic? I hope you know what those differences are. Um, know what synergy is. What does that get at? Synergistic effect of drugs. This is all talked about in the PowerPoint. Um, and we basically go through and we discuss in a similar way that chapter um, 11 talked about how different parts of the cell are targeted by different antimicrobial agents. Remember we talked about cell wall, cell membrane, nucleic acid and proteins, remember that? It's not dissimilar, only here we're talking about how do specific drugs, i.e. antibiotics, target cell walls? How do certain antibiotics target cell membranes, nucleic acids? How do they influence how proteins are synthesized? And how are metabolic, key metabolic pathways manipulated by certain drugs? So I think it's helpful to begin to link a particular drug like penicillin, penicillins, with cell wall uh, inhibition, the production of that peptidoglycan layer, for example. And I know it's kind of it's kind of a, a big chore to do, but maybe having, you know, again, five different note cards, one for each of these five characteristics and list the drugs underneath and just kind of get comfortable with with how, you know, what, what are the drugs? How, well, how do they impact the cell directly? And then specifically, you know, are we talking about manipulating the ribosomal subunit? Are we talking about circumventing a particular chemical pathway like the sulfonamide drugs do with sulfa drugs? Um, so that's what a, a big, big chunk of this chapter is devoted to. Right. And then I think we talked last week about viral antiviral um, drugs and how they influence HIV in particular. And then we talk about drug resistance and how that is thought to have formed. And what tricks up what bacteria have tricks up their sleeve to circumvent again the action of drugs. Again, I hope you've watched this this video. It's quite nice, quite good. Um, there's a question on efflux, I think, on the quiz the other day. That pump, right, that pumps the, the drug out of the cells. Just as soon as it comes in, it gets pumped out, right? So. And then some drug-human interactions. And uh, again, I, I would just kind of go through the PowerPoint. I think it's pretty well organized and again a lot of information I, I'm not saying there's not there's a lot of information in this chapter but uh, I think some of you said this is you know one of the more interesting chapters uh, you felt I think Monica said that um, and maybe it's because you know this is something that you can uh, you can sort of uh, uh, understand being you know healthcare professionals or soon to be healthcare professionals that that's kind of interesting to see how these antibiotics work if nothing else you know, how do I, how do I react when I'm given uh, a script for amoxicillin? What does it do? How does it work? How's it helping make me better, right? Okay, uh, I, I know I wasn't gonna get through everything, but um, that was just a super, super quick cursory overview. Um, any last minute comments, questions before we break? All right, I will see some of you in lab in 10 minutes. Um, the rest of you guys, I will see next Tuesday. Um, do try to get into um, Chapter 14, I think it is. Yeah. So that when we meet on Tuesday of next week, maybe we focus our attention on, on that chapter. 
Okay. See you in 10 minutes. Okay. Have a good rest of the day, guys.